Well, I'd like to welcome you to our next lecture in our November lecture series this year. My name is Chuck Smythe. I'm the director of the Culture and History Department here at Sea Alaska Heritage. And I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Perry Eaton, who's going to be speaking on the, the, the art of our ancestors, Kodiak Island art. Um, Perry Eaton doesn't need, does not need an introduction to a lot of us here. Uh, he's a native of Kodiak, grew up fishing with his father on his commercial fishing boat. Um, he's had an illustrious business career focusing on rural development around the state. He's the former CEO of the Community Enterprise Development Corporation, or CEDC as we called it. Um, and for 17 years, he was CEO of Alaska Village Initiatives. He's been a board member of Koniak, and maybe still be a board member, for, um, and numerous other organizations around the state. And he was always interested in preserving and sustaining Alaska Native culture and traditions. And he started uh, the second career, so to speak, uh, in that area, founding president and CEO of the Alaska Native Heritage Center in Anchorage, founding board member of the Alutic Museum in Kodiak, and he's on the board of the Alaska Native Art Foundation. Uh, after visiting collections in France and Russia, he began to carve in the traditional Alutic Sukpiak style. Uh, his work has contributed substantially to the revival and restoration of that art form, which essentially had disappeared. Uh, he's been a Rasmussen Fellow and a United States Artist Fellow, and his work has shown in Paris and at the Chateau Musée in Boulogne-sur-Mer, uh, home of the Pinar collection of Sukpiak masks collected in the 1870s. He was also instrumental in, erasing, in arranging the expedition of European collections in Alaska and the publication of, of the catalog of the Alutic Sukpiak collection in the Kunstkamera, formerly founded in 1714, and also known as Peter the Great Museum of Anthropology and Ethnography of the Russian Academy of Sciences. I'm very pleased to introduce Perry. Thank you. With introductions like that, you should just go home. <laughs> it's all said and done. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. This is really nice. I uh, was asked by Rosita if I wouldn't do that, and I jumped at the opportunity, so it's really exciting. Um, whenever I can talk about the work at home, I always am very excited. And when we think of indigenous work, we always need to understand the most important thing is place. Place. Place makes indigenous art. And it's so important, and for me it's Kodiak. And uh, Kodiak in 1945 was the most auspicious year in humanity because I was born. <laughs> and so I always like to put it up there because it's moments in time that carry indigenous art. Kodiak is fascinating. It, the location is sort of central to Alaska culturally. Uh, you've got the really strong uh, Kinkit Haida uh, cultures in the south. The Gulf, uh, Yupik, uh, very strong community. And uh, the Alutic uh, Sukpiak kind of sits right in between. And uh, the trade and travel in this area through the sea areas uh, out the chain towards the Aleut area was very strong. Uh, and you'll see it in the work. A lot of people don't realize that the Alutic art is so obscure that uh, it's not known by a lot of folks, but you're going to be amazed at the influences of cross-cultural activities. And there's a few reasons for that, and we'll talk about it. Art of our ancestors. In, in Kodiak, when I was growing up, there was no indigenous art. And now when I say that, I mean not a pair of earrings, not a basket, nothing, zero, zip few stone implements, uh, some uh, bone points, some spear points, those sorts of things that you dig out of the ground. No living art as a child. No identity, no cultural peace. It had completely been erased. And we'll talk a little about the reasons. But 
So as we look at art today and we look at the culture in Kodiak and particularly the, the reinstitution of, of, of ethnicity and the identity, um, it's actually the old work that we look at and we do the associations and we start to, oh, that's what grandma was talking about. But, but it's, it, it's gaps. So this is probably uh, the most recognizable iconic iconography of Aleutic art. It's a particular mask. It was collected in uh, 1842 in the village of, uh, of uh, uh, Woody Island, Lesnoy. Uh, and it's uh, been copied more times than any other single piece of work. And maybe some of you have actually seen this particular piece before. It's uh, classic in a couple of ways. It varies from uh, Yupik work. You'll notice that the oops, You'll notice that the uh, pieces are really nothing more than adornment. They're really decorative. They have no real meaning. In Yupik uh, art and Yupik masks, uh, they vary a lot coming around. They have a lot of symbolism in them. Uh, the Kodiak work doesn't do that. There's only five masks that survive that actually have the adornments on them. Um, this particular mask, this view right here, was what we saw uh, back in the 70s, 60s and 70s. And you notice this point right here on the chin or the tip of the mouth. Uh, when you see this view, this looks like it rounds out. And it's off, this mask is often reproduced incorrectly. And you can see that the mouth, when looked at in profile, is actually almost as far out as the nose. And this is, and I point this out only because when you're looking at catalogs, they'll give you one view, and it's so destructive. Uh, when we uh, at Koniag uh, financed the new catalog coming out of the Kutz camera, we required they have multiple views, and they fought us. They said, no, no, we don't do that. We, we know how to do a catalog. And we said, hey, you want our money? Do it our way. They did it our way. And they won an international award for the catalog, and it changed the entire way they do catalogs. <laughs> so so th this is sort of classic. Now, this particular mask shows some really interesting things. It also, 1842, Voronichki, I think his name was, you notice that these move, and they actually, when it dances, they actually hit with each other and create a, an audio portion. And the audio thing was very important, and, and I'll, I'll show you in some other work. Um, these are all baleen. They're tied on. Uh, the feather comes down is actually tied in the back. Fascinating about these particular pieces, they were connected, collected by Vornitsky, and I'm slaughtering his name, I know. He was sent here for 10 years, 1832 to 1842, and he was in Southeast, and his job was collection. That's his only job. He was not a hunter. He had no other job, just collect. And he, and he was not a scientist or anybody. He was just a guy working for the company sent to collect the stuff. He had a personal ethic. And his personal ethic was he would not collect anything out of context. He collected these the night the dance, the night they were danced. And he took them right from the dance. He bought them from the dancers. Really important, there was a story told that I heard as a kid about this guy. He was going down the beach in Old Harbor Village. There were eight kayaks getting ready to go hunt. And he walked down the line and he said, that one. And he sent the men home to change clothes. And he took that entire kayak as it was headed out to hunt. And I've actually seen it. It's, it's in Russia, the actual boat. And uh, I had no idea the story was actually true. I mean, you know, you hear these stories, but yeah. Fascinating, these masks had never been photographed from the back. If he pulled them out of the dance, the back's going to tell you as much story as the front. Going to tell you how it was worn, going to tell you how it was made, going to tell you how it was attached. This knowledge didn't exist anywhere. There's the back. I had them photograph the back. Now the interesting thing is this is a bite plate. The mask is actually worn in front of the face, 
not around the face, as you might think. It was actually worn in front of the face. And it was tied on, just kind of, you know, around. These were the little attachments. Uh, nobody had ever asked to look at the back of the mask. And we'll talk about that a little more as we go through this. Here's another mask, a hunter's mask. Um, and these are the only ones that are adorned. Now you'll notice here, and we, we learned, movement was absolutely critical. If you take an eagle feather and you s drill a hole here and you stuff it in, it won't move. It's a very stiff feather. So what you do is you take a cormorant feather and you stuff it from this side, clip the bottom off of the eagle feather and slide it over the cormorant feather and it will dance. It will dance. All of these things were sort of discoveries as we're holding these things and looking at these objects in the, in the museums. Here's the back of that mask. Again, bite plate, tied on. This is a plank mask, one of two surviving. Uh, there are some smaller kind of models of them about so big. Uh, this, this type of mask was only made on Kodiak Island. And you had an effigy, always an effigy, human effigy, and then a story. And this mask is called Happy Fellow. And these are actually fish. And he's a provider of fish in the village, uh, a steady supplier of fish, as the lines might imply. And here again, the feathers are very movable. These are wooden pieces. And when this danced, it must have been really incredible. It must have just really moved around. There's an example of the feather. And here's the last one. Again, you can see that the pieces are close enough so that they actually touch and make noise. Um, this is the only piece of Kodiak material that actually has bear in it. And while Kodiak is the home of the largest bear in the world, our mythology is absolutely silent. There's no stories. You don't talk about the bear. Um, you can talk about other people coming and hunting it, but you never talk about your hunt. You never talk about your encounters. Uh, and it's not something that you're taught. It's just something you do. My father was a professional guide. I never heard a story about the bear. A story about the hunters. The white hunters, never ever a story about the bear. And this is the only piece. And there's very few ivory carvings. There's very, very few references to the bear. And uh, there are theories, of course, everybody has a theory, but I believe that he was part of the family. He was an integrated piece of the family. Beautiful work. Um, this is uh, all painted with feathers. Um, these dots appear a lot on Aleutic art, particularly Kodiak Island. And um, they, they, they challenged me. How'd they do that? I mean, look, you, look, try and do that with a feather sometime. I played with that for weeks. Actually, that's a stencil, a stamp. Puchki, you know this, this celery plant with the stalk? That's, you just put it in a paint, you just keep touching it, and you get a perfect circle every time. <laughs> Took me a long time to figure that out, about a year and a half. And I, I said, you know, this has got to be, and you'll notice that it's not even all the way around. There's kind of missing some paint here, and that's, that's, that's a stamp. This, this is a really good example. This is a mask in the Pinart collection. Those others were in the, the Russian collection. These, this is in the art collection and this one was separated from the original and is actually um, at the at the uh, Quai Branly now the Museum of Ethnology in Paris this is a classic case and I, I put this in here to demonstrate that Western art is lit from above we never think about it but it's, it's, you walk into a room, into a museum, and it's lit from above. In a room like here, it's, it's there. Our masks were lit from the bottom. 
It was lit from the bottom. It was lit from a fire pit. They were danced inside. That's a different presentation than that. Completely. So when we look at the petroglyphs on Kodiak, that's what you see. You don't see the top of the head. That's all in shadow. That's all gone. That's all gone. This is what you see. Very interesting. Uh, clothing, and, and we'll, we'll talk about beads and clothing and whatnot. And this is a great story, too. This jerkin, this uh, piece here, is in Finland. And uh, the factor of uh, the Russian-American company in the 1830s and 40s was a guy named Etelin. And he was a Finn. Of course, he was a Russian because Finland was under Russia during that period of time, but he was actually a Finn. And uh, he was in charge of the collections and, uh, you know, just one of those things that falls under his office. But he did an interesting thing. Uh, when he was getting ready to ship the stuff back, he just kind of divided it up the middle and said, okay, send this one to Helsinki and send this one to St. Petersburg. The pants for this jerkin are in St. Petersburg. Literally. Uh, beautiful, beautiful work. Um, wonderful design work. Um, all of this stitching, and, and for you ladies that stitch, or you men even that stitch, that's all braided sinew, not a thread. That's a thread made out of braided sinew. Three braids. Three, three braids. And I, and I think my grandmother used to crochet. My great-grandmother, and they'd be visiting, you know, and, drinking tea, and the hands were going, never hardly look. And I think it's a direct derivative of making senu string and things. Uh, when I look through the museums today, they made that stuff by ball. I mean, that stuff, they, they, bows are wrapped with it. They've got masks that are wrapped with it. It's never used sparingly. They, they had an abundance of it whaling culture, so you've got these beautiful long, long sinews, and they, they, they braided this stuff. Uh, all of this is braided sinew. You'll notice the puffin beaks. Uh, puffin was a, a major food source. It's relatively an easy bird to harvest. You can do it with a little net during nesting time up in the rocks and things, and they're very easy and abundant to collect, and they're quite a tasty little bird. <coughs> Honest. Uh, and, and the beak was really, really bright orange. I do, an, as an artist, I do an interesting thing. I will um, sit down and start erasing colors. Take all the colors that you see today and start erasing the ones that didn't exist in 1790. You know, all your fluorescents go. You know, all these brilliant greens go. And you start to think about what the palette was in 1800. And, you know, I literally, I will walk and I go to a place mentally over on the other side of, of Spruce Island, where I, the village, and I'll sit down on a log and I'll look out there and I'll say, what did my ancestors see? Where were the colors? And it's really the birds and the plants. The pollution in the atmosphere, you didn't get the vibrant uh, sunsets we get today. But the plants and the animals. So this orange that you see in this beak was a, a highly valued, vibrant. It, it was the fluorescent of the day. So very important. Onyek, the... Uh, uh, our equivalent of the umiak or the uh, boat. Uh, these models uh, exist. This is in Russia, this one. Beautifully executed. It's actually a miniature. It's a perfectly constructed boat. You can see the joints that were put in there. And this, this boat is only about that big. And it's absolutely perfect. Uh, and you get really excited when you see this stuff. I mean, you just sort of like, mm -hmm, I can't believe it. Look at that. Uh, again, the braided sinew all put together correctly. The cross piece is really interesting design. Very simple, very practical, uh, very strong, tied together with the uh, sea lion hides. Uh, 
Now this is where it gets really interesting cross-culturally. You'll notice the hats and you immediately sink southeast. Just boom. Hello, Kodiak Island. Kodiak Island. Um, we, this is uh, my really good friend Will Anderson and I, and we're f photographing these collections. And as men, we get focused on the boat. I mean, you know, you give a, you give a guy a kayak model and he, he can't see anything other than the kayak. You know, the guy in there, that's the doll. The girls play with the dolls, right? And you see you're looking at the boat. And uh, we photographed the boats in great detail, only to find out the story was in the dolls. The story was in the men. And the men told us more than the boat told us. And I'll show you. Uh, these are the men. We found out later that when we traveled anywhere, we always painted our face. We always painted our face. And um, we ended up taking the pictures of the face paintings. And you're looking at portraits. If you made a model of a kayak, wouldn't you put Uncle George in it? Stands to reason. And you certainly wouldn't put face painting that didn't belong to your clan or family. So you're actually looking at portraits. And we have about uh, 25 of these. Now that face is less than an inch tall. And the detail put in that, given the tools of the day, is really quite impressive. Quite impressive. And you'll notice the form art on the hat. Treasures. Unbeknownst. We actually took these photos because, you know, it's there. You might as well shoot it while you're there. Not realizing what we were capturing. And you also captured the, the head? Oh, yes, 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 yes. We'll talk a little more about that. I know this guy, by the way. He actually looks like one of my cousins. <laughs> this is interesting. This is a box in uh, Finland. And uh, it's in the Ethelin Collection catalog, that black book. Uh, and uh, it's in black and white. And now this is a classic case. You can't believe everything you read. The description in the book says this is a food box, storage box, that was used in the kayak. OK. You ever been in a kayak? A wooden round box with a lid? That doesn't store well. It doesn't go into the kayak well. You've got all of these other methodologies of putting stuff in a kayak. That wooden box makes really no sense. But an anthropologist, uh, uh, an expert, excuse me, but an expert said that. So it's in the book. And, you know, it's got all the initials after the name that said so. So you have a tendency to believe it. Look on the top. See that? See that X? That tells you what it is right there. You see this? You see this? That's a bird. That's a puffin. Down on the sides, these were described as whale tails. That's a bird in profile, separated out. And what it is, is a box for that rattle. Not only, they have about six of these rattles. They have four boxes. This rattle fits in that box. It's exactly the right size for the box. Makes perfect sense. Um, this is a terrible slide, but it's so cool. It's the only picture I have. <clears throat> this particular style of bowl was very, very traditional. And we see many of them in the collections around the world. Uh, the top, in fact, some of them actually have a groove that comes up so you can pour the oil out of the bowl for guests down into the little bowl. Uh, the bird form is always used. This one actually has a mask, has a spirit inside the bowl right there. Um, and it, you can't quite see, but there's eyes here. It's the only one of its kind. This is in Talon, Estonia along with eight items that just ended up in Tallinn, Estonia. 
and we found it by accident. Uh, one of our friends said, oh yeah, I think there's some in Talon. Oh, okay, so we went over and sure as heck. They have two kayak models here that are just absolutely exquisite. This particular bowl is, is for an artist, for me, one of the more exciting pieces from Kodiak, and it, it tells me the sophistication level. We saw this bowl, it is in Russia. It's a classic dish, uh, Klinka style, it has the same shape, it's up and down the coast. Uh, we looked at it and uh, it's beautifully made, beautifully preserved. It's made out of uh, fur, but it's weird. You got a nose, and, and I mean, it just doesn't make sense. There's no eyes, no seal. I mean, we looked at it and there were three of us and, and we literally couldn't figure it out. It was a really strange piece. So we set it aside, didn't think anything else of it. Um, here's a different shot. About two years after I took these photographs, I was working on a mask and we were a whaling culture. Can you believe that? Look at that. The wave comes off. The break across the top comes right across. You can see the wave coming off. Here's the white line you can see in here. and That's our finback whale. But if you've never been up next to one, you would never know that. Now, we were whalers, and, and we hunted with a poison lance. Uh, and we had fraternities, whaling fraternities, and they would go out, and when the finbacks and the humpbacks came into the bay, they would study the pods, and uh, they would actually pick out the whale that was to be harvested. And um, a whale, being a mammal, is right-handed, left-handed. It's called weak side, strong side. You study the animal, you study the pattern, and then you go and, and ritually get ready. Because you're going to take some 17, 18 year old kid, put him in a boat made out of some sticks and a hide, and you're going to send him out there and he's going to poke that thing with a sharp stick. <laughs> not me. I mean, I could not imagine the courage that took. Paddle up next to that freight train. And a finback is a perfect whale for this kind of harvest. It's a very, very long, skinny whale. It's the fastest of all the whales. Um, and when it rolls, that flank comes out of the water and stays out of the water for a long time. It isn't like a humpback, and it doesn't bring its tail out of the water. So you have less of a chance, like a humpback brings the tail out. If you're up next to it in a kayak, you could get caught on that tail. Finback doesn't do that. So you've got this long flank, and basically what you're going to do is run up and give it a hypodermic shot. We used a slate point, uh, anywhere from 13 to 17 inches long. It was scored. It had poison, uh, poison on it. And uh, you basically lance the whale in the flank, in the hip, and um, three days later, it died. The lances are fascinating. There's four of them that have survived. Uh, they're all, no, there's one in Finland, there's three in Russia. Um, it has a little float on it, and the whale, it, you lance the whale, the whale naturally flinches, the muscle breaks that slate, very thin slate uh, point, and then the lance comes out and they gather the lance back and they can look at the tip and see just how much poison is in the whale by how much broke off and how much came out, and then three days, now that fraternity needs to know what stage of the tide, because when that thing hits the beach, you want the tides dropping during the day so you can harvest. Uh, you've got to know the pattern of the tides because it's going to drift. Uh, and they were good. They knew what beach that thing would grow. In fact, there's beaches at home called catcher beaches. Literally beaches where that's where it's going to wash up. The bowl was just exciting, just exciting. I mean, that's, that's a sophistication and an abstraction of art at, at one of the highest levels. Baskets, lots of baskets. Um, when I was a kid, no baskets on the island, none, all gone. Uh, this is a grass basket in the Kutz camera. It's about uh, 20 inches tall. It, hasn't been out of storage. When we, when we brought it out, it hadn't been out of storage for over 100 years. 
it's vibrant. The colors are just beautiful. And, and tight, even, beautiful work, just stunning. That's, that's, this basket goes back to uh, 1805. Look at the colors, the variations. Beautiful work. Uh, when we photograph these, uh, we photograph, I, I think we, we probably have uh, 60 photographs of this basket, every turn, every stitch every start, everything, and, and uh, uh, we keep it all at the museum and it's available for folks. And, and we have groups that come in and study it and work on, work on it. Now, form art. This is a Kodiak piece. That's, it's the only objects we have that have teeth. None of our masks have teeth. And there's no ears on any of our masks, with one exception out of Prince William Sound. But our form art has teeth. Beautiful colors. Again, some of this stuff hadn't been out of storage in years and years and years and years. Headdresses, the beaded headdress. These are three sets in France. They're the only three sets of beaded headdresses that have the matching belts and cuffs. The only pieces in the world that survived intact. These were collected 1872 in a Fognac. Uh, we've worked with the museum, and they're going to loan us one on a four-year uh, loan for our museum in Kodiak so that our, our beaders can see the original work. Uh, stunning stuff. These were collected by Alphonse Pinart. You can see here's a um, rattle, the puff and beak rattle. Um, when I see this stuff as a banker, I, I slip back into the economics. You know what you're looking at here is you're looking at the Ferraris. You're looking at the Porsches in the village. I mean, the exchange rate was like 10, 15 beads for one otter pelt. That's a whole clan's efforts. Maybe two seasons, three seasons. I mean, the woman that wore this was somebody. Somebody. Very, very impressive. Beautiful work. All senu. They were bought by Pinard. So I'll send you in here and then decorative. We think of the faceted beads today. Uh, if you can find these original faceted trade beads, they're about $60 a piece. <laughs> I mean, what you're looking at there is almost incredible. Just absolutely incredible. The otter uh, really dominates. Uh, we see this particular form of the feeding otter in um, many, many motifs. Uh, very, very, very common, both, uh, both in the Aleutic art and Aleut art. Um, all, always uh, the chest and the ribs. I have no idea the significance. No idea. I actually have jewelry. I have a piece, uh, some jewelry, a neck piece uh, made like this originally. Ivory was trade, uh, bone and ivory off the mainland. These are, uh, uh, these are in Tallinn, Estonia, and these are in uh, Finland, in Helsinki. More beads. The masks, and the masks have played a tremendous role in, in the rejuvenation of identity on the island. And um, one of the things, again, that uh, the catalogs don't do for you is they don't represent size. And so you'll see a single photograph of a mask, and you'll turn the page, and there's another photograph of another mask, and you have no idea the relative size of the two. Um, so here you, you see some of our large masks, 
And we have one that's 24 inches tall. I mean, it's a very, very, very large piece. Um, and uh, compared to Yupik masks, and they had some very, very large ones, but lots of adornment and a, a lots, but very similar technique. All of these masks came out of the whaling fraternities. These all came out of a single cave at a single point in time, which makes this collection very, very important for us. Um, when you go to the museum and you see this and this and this and this representing a culture, you might be looking at 60 to 100 years spread. The beauty of this collection is it was all in one point of time and it stayed together. So you can really study technique, uh, you can study uh, art form. You'll notice the cuts here, that brow cut for the bottom lit. Uh, some of these, while looking grotesque, kind of sitting here, you have to picture them being lit from the bottom and being danced. And, and what you're really seeing is these shadow areas. Um, and we've worked with this one museum that I just think the world of. Um, they actually let us black out the windows and actually do bottom lit, and we looked, I mean, it was just wonderful. We walked in and they had them all spread out on a table like this. There was a stack of white gloves on the end and they said, whatever. Nobody was there to see that you didn't do this or do that or anything, it just, it was great. And, and this is sort of a classic case of psychologically taking ownership without possession. Very interesting psychological thing. This collection, the Pinart collection, the people on the island really do own it. We don't possess it, but we own it. It's our stuff. And, and, and possession is really critical in some cultures and we're finding it's not as critical and we think because of the evolution of our culture having lost almost all of these objects, uh, to have them available and accessible, you can actually take ownership. This is the very large mask. This is a 23-inch mask. And this um, is another classic case. There was an anthropologist in the 18, or 1950s, a German lady, Falk, I think was her last name, and she wrote one of the very first papers on this collection and she said that this, this mask, and this mask is 23 inches tall without the hoops and feathers, so you can imagine what it was like when it was put together. Uh, she said it was too large to dance. And this was the picture in the catalog, and I bought into that. Right up until the time I went and I saw the back. That sits on the top of your head. There's a hole through here for attachment. Now, if you're sitting there with a little beaver tooth chisel, you're going to do that for a mask that you're not going to wear? It's not logical. Not logical. So here's a, a professor, you know, and this was, this was danced on your knees. It's a very wide eyed. The eyes, you notice, don't even go through on this particular piece. Um, the mouth is attached here. And again, uh, we were told that that was for structural strength. All of our bird masks are tied here. And the bird is a very, very common theme. And the bird, in, and we also have to remember what the utility of this is. This is a tool of transformation. This is not something you dance for decorative or entertainment. This is a transformation tool. And we believe that our ancestors held the knowledge and you needed to communicate with those ancestors and you needed the support of those ancestors to survive. We had five worlds and you needed to move between them and you needed transformation to be able to do that. Humans still do that. They don't think of it that way. But I've seen many, many a Catholic person go into the church and pray to the Virgin Mary. Is there a real difference in there? This mask is tied here. Now, the bird was the messenger. The bird was the messenger between the worlds. So if you had a message and you wanted to communicate, you used a bird mask, a transformation. Well, 
if you're going to send a messenger in between the worlds, you sure don't want him gossiping along the way, do you? So you tie the beak. And you know how chatty those magpies can get. You don't want them, you don't want them spreading your gossip. So tie the beak. We only have one mask in the entire 120, 130 that have survived that doesn't have the beak tied. And it's an articulated mask and actually had probably a fish or something in the mouth. These are interesting. This is the back of this mask. Uh, there is a series of masks uh, carved by the same person. And one of the ways you look at a mask, and this is an artist talking now, is you look at the back of the mask. These are all back of the mask. These were all carved by the same person. And you can see how the eyes are hollowed out. You see the angle of the nose. And you notice how the rounding of the mouth comes in on the back. An artist will hollow out a mask exactly the same way no matter what's on the front. It's like a signature. It's like an Adzing signature. Same thing. Nobody knew these masks had been made by the same person and, and until I made the discovery. And there's actually a fourth one also. But uh, very interesting. These are all shamanistic masks. Uh, this is hydrocephalus. Uh, it's a hunter or a warrior that's uh, had an injury in the head. It hasn't drained. The head swells. Um, when babies are born, you know, they'll put a shunt in if they have water on, on, the, on the brain. And uh, so this is a hydrocephalus issue. Uh, this um, mask has 13 knots in it. Now, if you're a mask carver, the last thing in the world you want to deal with is a knot, much alone 13 of them. And I've been looking for a piece of wood with 13 knots in it. I can't find one. So this is kind of a rarity. Um, my theory is we suffered um, uh, skin ulcers from, uh, from the kayak and the water and the moisture a lot. And the Russians make a, several comments about it in some of their writings. I think maybe this mask is dealing with that. Uh, you'll notice this mask has a cut across here. And uh, this mask also has a cut. And when you're doing a mask, you have to, that, that was effort. You, you put that in there. That's not an accident. That's a very traditional female tattoo. In our culture, we had transsexuals. Not homosexuals, transsexuals. And when children were born, a parent could make a choice of how they were going to raise that child. What gender. And uh, we had men that were raised as women. And uh, they were very important in the culture. Very, very, very valued, highly valued. And because they had gone through this uh, transformation, frequently uh, they were shaman. And our shaman were elected three different ways, and sometimes you didn't have a choice. Um, but these sets of masks begs a really interesting question that there's no real answer to. Were they made by a transsexual? Were these the marks of a female carver? And was it? a female female, or was it a male female? And where were the taboo lines between the genders? Very interesting questions, fascinating questions. Today, and, and we'll now look at some of the influences of the art form, this is uh, Andrew Albio, one of the uh, Aleut artists. He's uh, from Chignik, he's actually from the Bristol Bay side, and um, he, you can see the influence of the old art, um, and you can see the beads on the work here that when the mass dances, they create the weight that creates the movement. Very, very important. Uh, I think I put some, of, yeah, this is some of my work. Um, influence, the inlay, influenced by Southeast, I might add. I mean, the, the abalone work in Southeast is just stunning. I love it. Uh, we don't have abalone, but we have these little rock oysters, so I've used th those. Um, here's a, a mask that I did that really, I tried to step beyond. Using the box, without stepping out of, totally out of the box, but let's use some of that vibrant color that's available. And, and this begs a question, I frequently get asked, do you make the masks in a traditional way? And I always tell people I do it exactly the way my ancestors did, with the best tools available. Honoring the puffin, 
very Alutic style, flat back. Every mask in all of our collections have a flat mask with one exception, and it's a, a jaw that's uh, open on the bottom, and it's an articulated mask. It actually had a jaw that worked, and they'd lost the jaw. But they're all flat backed, and that also begs the question of how were they made? Uh, the traditional tool in Southeast uh, cultures and the coastal culture is the crooked knife and you're holding the work and you're working it this way. Ours are all flat. We used pushing tools and we had an absolute abundance of pumice. So you could sand them out like nothing. You had all that natural tool. So normally the puffin is done more like a helmet. So taking it apart and flattening it out in a Lutic style was, was, this took me a while to, to get there. But this is a, a dance mask honoring the dance. And um, <clears throat> I took a lot of liberties. You ever seen an Lutic dancer with a tutu? <laughs> it was done for a lady in New York that had danced. And I thought, the dance really is universal. You know, it's one of the only activities it is universal to the human species. We're the only species on the earth that moves to a rhythm, a prescribed rhythm. And the dance is universal. All human cultures dance. Again, staying in the box, you know, where is the art form gone? Can, can you do a modern piece of Alutic art? And Yeah. And all of these masks are capable of dancing. I don't put the harness in all of them, but they're all hollowed. They're all alive. They all have eyes. They all have nose. They all breathe, and they all have a mouth. They can all dance, and many of them have danced. Just classic shape and form. This particular shape is almost universal in Alaska. This is, this is a fascinating mask. Belief systems are, you, you get into a lot of really instant fight over belief systems. And um, there is a mask in our history that has these pieces that hang down. And um, there are those that thought they were walrus tusks or something. And actually, I heard a story as a boy that this mask was designed this way so you couldn't bow your head like the missionaries. You couldn't bring your head down. You had to hold your head up. So I made this mask. It's called The Shaman and His Helpers. And I put the birds in just to kind of play with that. Uh, this mask is either here or in Sheldon Jackson Museum. I'm not sure which. This is, um, oh, that slide didn't uh, quite take. And this is another example. This is Alvin Amison, if you know Alvin's work. Uh, probably the most famous Kodiak artist, uh, internationally known, uh, painted for years and years. And he has this style of, uh, he's also my studio mate. But uh, the style is really interesting because it's always a frontal look and it's always facing the group and it's always an animal. And abstractly, it's a mask. And he did this kind of work and he just evolved into it without really trying to respect or reflect Kodiak art. It just was one of those inherent kinds of things. And, and I think that there is a genetic memory, a cultural memory that comes down. And Alvin's work is uh, very, very classic in that regard. Movement, he's got it. Here's a bear that he does. And, and his bears and otters are famous. There's poster, posters all over, yeah. And, and he's a hoot. Uh, we, we have a great time in the studio. His, uh, he was raised by his grandfather, who was also a, a bear guide and a fisherman. 
but he was a gill netter and I was a saner. And so we sort of grew up side by side without really crossing. And so he tells his side of the story and I'll tell my side of the story at the same time and we were in the same place, saw the same thing and never compared the stories. And they're different. <laughs> yeah, they're different. I've straightened him out on a lot of things. <laughs> So, we go back to place. It's all about place. Time and place. And while the culture's changed, and while the culture's evolved, it's there, but the place never changes. Just the moment in time. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Look at, look at that. Can you see that? I raced through some of those slides. But, <laughs> but I'd be happy to respond to any questions you might have. Yes. We'll go here and then there. Um, hi. Uh, thank you. That was just fabulous. I really, really appreciated it. Um, I'm particularly interested in how objects are, are part of our collective identity, so this, this has been you know, very much associated with that. Can you talk about the, the boat, um, the one that used the miniature that was done so perfectly? Yes. What do you, what do you know about that boat, and, and what about art that's related to the sea along with... The Onyak is uh, really interesting. The, um, we'll get back here. The boat models are, are one of the things that are uh, frequently you see in museums all over. Uh, and um, there is a great collection in the, um, well, St. Petersburg has three museums that all have boats in them. None of them talk to each other. None of them know each other's have them. Um, and the Naval Museum has them. This particular style of boat was used in Kodiak. And, it, and <coughs> what differentiated it was this bow. Um, and it's not a clean bow. And you notice the modern ships today have this piece there that breaks and it keeps the bow from coming up. So it cuts in the water a lot, a lot smoother. Uh, and a rough sea uh, is, is moderated to some degree. The uh, boats were used, uh, I mean Kodiak is, uh, it's, it's like on the outside, there's very little protected water. I mean, it's like the outside of the archipelago. You get a, a lot of sea, and we grew up on a lot of rough water. Um, I don't know a lot about the boats. We've, we had um, a group build one in Kodiak this last year, and it's the first one that's been built that anybody can remember, of course. And um, we're going to try it out. It, 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 the frame is done, but we haven't covered it. The fishing game frowns on the sea lion hides we need. Oh yeah, yeah. It was made from this model. This model. Oh yeah. Oh, I mean, it, everything is there. All the joinery is there. All the shapes, um, weight, size, the way it's all put together was all there. So do you suppose that that's not a piece of art as much as it's a piece of instruction? I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just wondering. Yeah, one of the really difficult things, when we talk about indigenous art, you talk about utility. And uh, we don't think today in, in a Western culture about utility. What is the most utilitarian piece of art in your life? I know the answer. There's an answer. What is it? What is the single most utilitarian thing you buy and the way it looks often determines whether you buy it or not. Car, absolutely. When the anthropologists 500 years from now are putting the stuff on a pedestal, it, you know, it won't be the uh, Egyptian esophagus, it, it, it'll be a 1932 Ford. That, that influence, that's, that's the most utilitarian piece of artwork we use. But we don't think of it that way. And when we think of these and we think of art, too often we use Western values to define art. Um, you cannot have a culture without art. 
We use design and presentation. The visual presentation of culture is absolute. At any point in time, whether it's a uniform of a military soldier or whatever it is, we use culturally art. And it's a utility that when you particularly look at, at the older works, and, in, and one of the big arguments I have in Europe is they call this an artifact. It's not art. So, and when we go around and around and around, you know, how elaborate do you need a tool of transformation? Well, you're going to make it the best you can, naturally. You look at the art of, of belief systems. I, I mean, the, the Christian religion has produced art beyond belief. It's all utilitarian art. It's just very elaborate utilitarian art. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Yes. Hi. Welcome to Southeast. Thank you. <laughs> Long time you see. Yeah. So when I last saw you, you were so busy in the business world that you can Tell me a little bit of how did you end up deciding to do art? It was that genetic memory that called you? No. I, first art lesson I ever took was eight years old. And my major in college was art. And my family actually paid for art lessons when I was eight because it kept me out of fights. They thought that was a good way of taming. So I've studied art all my life. And the problem, and this, this is again is an interesting dilemma in the American culture. If I tell people I'm an artist, they really want to know what my real job is. What do you really do? And this idea of being an artist uh, certainly influenced me in my career. Uh, so I majored in art, minored in business, and became a banker because it paid the mortgage. So you, you, you had this duality. Uh, and I spent years in photography, uh, black and white photography. Um, and I've shown in the, in the Kremlin, in Russia, in Europe, uh, my, my artwork. But the indigenous art and the coming home, it's a direct result of land claim settlement. There's, you can't tie it to anything else. Land claims, I don't know about here, but in Kodiak, it gave you dignity. When I was growing up, you, you, you weren't native if you didn't have to be. I mean, you know, I was so damn happy when the Japanese got here with sushi. I mean, I went from a savage to a gourmet. I mean, there was, you didn't do that stuff in public. You just didn't do it. So the land claims uh, legitimized your identity. And then once you signed up, then you ask yourself, who am I? And then you start the search. I'm Scott Carley from the Alaska State Museum. I just need to tell you that because my question involves museums, so I want you to know okay. I'm a museum person. We won't hold that against you. It's okay. okay. It's all right. <laughs> well, that's kind of my question, yeah. actually. Um, I'm really interested in, in this concept that you brought up of ownership versus possession. Yeah. I think that's really important. And I'd, I'd really like to hear some more about that, like the role that museums play or the role that cultural centers play, like where we are today. Is that different? Um, where are we heading? You know, what's the next? You know, what's the next iteration of museum? Well, it's the interesting you bring that up. We're having a symposium in, uh, in France this summer to actually talk about some of those issues. Um, my personal, personal position, if I have access, I don't care where it is. I mean, if I have to go to the Smithsonian or Paris, let's see, Washington, D.C. or Paris? Washington, D.C., Paris. Hey, another two hours. I mean, you know, I'll... Phew, Paris is a lot more fun. It, it doesn't matter to me where it is. It's the accessibility. How close can I get to it? Can I actually touch it? Can I work with it? Um, how cooperative? Now, uh, I've worked with museums. Uh, I call them old school museums. You know, you walk in and the little lady's there. Yes, we have one of those. Well, you want to see it? 
Well, can I touch it? No. It's in a case. I mean, you know, just so possessive um, that, that you, it's worthless. It might as well, I mean, I can't get to it. Other museums like the one in Ballon Smir, I could make a phone call right now, identify six objects, say I'm going to be there in 48 hours, they'll pull them out of the case. They'll take them off the floor. Uh, Smithsonian now is getting wonderful in, in the exhibit in uh, Anchorage. As an artist, as a cultural activist, if, if I want to work with that mass, they'll take it right out of the case and, and I have access. To me, that's the really important thing. Um, repatriation, uh, human remains, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. They do not belong in a museum. And, and things that belonged to identifiable people, that was his. They, can, they should be returned or, or accessible to the extent that the utility can be embraced. And, and that's sort of where I am. I am so thankful that Pinart took the material with him and kept it. And then he made a couple of decisions that were just unbelievable. He donated that entire collection to one museum at one point in time. So it's totally intact. And you know, during the uh, late 1800s, early, uh, these were curios. You know, a guy went out in the woods and he collected all this stuff and he got back, made a few lecture series and he's got it and he sold it off as curios one at a time. And, and this, I mean, thank you. I mean, I'm grateful to the guy. Uh, we actually danced a mask in his honor on his 100th anniversary of passing. So, uh, yeah, well, I, that's, that's kind of where I am. Cultural centers versus museums, do you see a difference? Oh, sure, sure. I, I think a museum's job is to preserve, uh, to, to have it, and to keep it in its context, in its moment. Uh, a culture center is a living activity, and, and the only constant in culture is change. So a culture center embraces that change and moves with it and adapts and, 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 and does those kind of things. Can you do two in the same place? Sure. But they're two different functions, I think. They're two different functions. So like a cultural center would have a museum component, let's say. Sure. It, it can have objects that are preserved in their state. But they can also have utility objects. And if you take something out and you dance it, you're going to break something. You're going to fix it. I mean, the stuff gets repaired. I was in Paris. I was at the uh, Quai Branly, and they had just bought uh, the uh, Yupik mask out of one of the surrealist Brene or whatever it was. Yeah. And they took me down to look at it. And they had it in the laboratory, I called it, you know, White Palace, and down in stairs. And I'm looking at it, and it had been broken on a corner and had been repaired with a cormorant feather. It was really cool, all tied together, and I pointed that out. And they hadn't seen that before. They thought that was part of the, but no, that was a repair. And then I'm looking at it, and I started to laugh. Somebody had taken the thing apart at some point and turned the hands upside down. The hands on the mask, I don't know if you know the mask, it's, it's one that has a lot of, and it has the hands. Well, on most, with just an exception, but on most Yupik masks, there's no thumb on the hand because you don't want the spirit to grab you. You know, you want to work with them, but you don't want to. And they turned it and the thumbs were down. And I pointed that out and, and the, the people, oh, oh, I don't think so. I'm, you know. I said, yeah, yeah, that's wrong. They actually did some research and when it was bought in New York, it had been disassembled to ship and it had been reassembled incorrect. Now, here's an interesting as a museum person. This is a very famous mask owned by a very famous surrealist in France. If it had not been owned by the surrealist in France, it would be worth about 400,000. It sold for 4 million because it came out of his collection. His wife turned the hands upside down. Do you change it? They didn't. But they did note that. 
it, it became part of the mystique of the mass. Yes. My name is Brianna. I work for the museum here in the Disney Honor, the Mage Ribbon Museum, because I feel like I'm supporting and I'm holding up our ancestors, and I love being able to do it not only for my own plan, but as a representative of other groups in Alaska. It's really an honor to do that. I also put data entry into the system and would love to have a copy that we can link to because I like the idea of being able to tap and print, you know, put on it and have it actually hear your voice. Is there a recording of yourself that we can link our system to? No. <laughs> I, I've never been approached with anything like that. They made a recording today. Yeah, this will be available. I have to say that I am so glad, you know, that we have this recorded because, I mean, I think you, it's just so provocative in many, many ways. And I think, you know, the museum question is but one question. And uh, I've been sitting here thinking as an anthropologist and as a native person. And I think that's a really new, uh, something new where, uh, you know, you have Native people and you have an anthropologist, and I'm taking a look at you, and I'm looking at you as an anthropologist. I said, it's fascinating. It must be the first time that we have an indigenous person that is going and studying his culture from museums, and really, but he have, he's bringing his knowledge that he has of home and place, the things that created that, that gave rise to that, and that was kind of, a, a, you, what you call it, the DNA, but it is, you know, you're bringing that kind of traditional knowledge to looking at something that you haven't seen in your, your homeland for hundreds of years. That is fascinating. And I suspect that uh, a lot of things that you've said will be challenged by other anthropologists. Yes. Some of the things where I think you've made, you know, assumptions, assertions, you know, yep. and they'll say, well, how in the world could he, how in the world is that so? And they may be looking at, and I think that's great, you know, I hope they do that. But it's really, to me, I've been thinking about anthropologists. You know, I said I am an anthropologist. But, you know, we just had um, this conference, Sharing Our Knowledge, and, they ha and now you're able to watch some of these anthropologists and some of the folly that they make, you know. And you feel like, oh, I'm going to go back and correct that. You know, at some point in time, we'll write a paper about it. You can do the kind, same kind of thing, you know, in, in the work that you've done. Um, the, other, the other issue you brought up was land claims. I mean, the other dimension of it is that probably there is no other group that would have been would have number one gone to the extreme yeah. that you have in studying your culture, but it's made possible also by land claims. Yes. So there are just so many you know dimensions to your lecture that I think it really warrants you know uh, further discussion. I think we need to look at that at your at this video again. I think we need to raise that question about the difference between cultural, cultural centers and museums because I think there's also differences between cultures. I mean, our culture yes. is still alive, vibrant, you know, we have still a lot of our traditional ceremonial practices. And I was thinking, you know, when we had Robert Davidson here last week, and he talked about uh, the canoe, and he said that was made by carpenters, you know, not artists. But yet there's still art in there. And um, I don't know what I want to say about, you know, the cultural, that those differences, but I think it's really important because, you know, what we're trying to do here is um, it's a very different kind of museum. It's a museum in reality, but it's also very different because we are using, you know, clan pieces. They're taking them out. And I know Nadine is hysterical. <laughs> uh, these are these should be, you know, right. protected and everything. But just so fascinating. We're going to have to talk some more and really identify some of these topical things. I think we should have, you know, seminars on it. I think good. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I have. Well, thank you. If you have five more minutes, I don't know if we have five more minutes. <laughs> I actually have a slideshow of a ceremony that we've brought back on Kodiak Island, if you'd like to see it. Who can run the machine here? We, and I'll set this up while she is, when you go back to the stick, it's under Gordon, or Godfrey. We, have a, we had a ceremony way back, and it hadn't been performed in years and years. 
we have a, a life closure, classic life closure session. And about uh, a year and a half to two years after passing, we send the soul on its trip to the next world. And uh, we do it with a ceremony. And we do it a mask, a plank mask. And we do a transformation. This was uh, a ceremony. We've performed this now about six or seven times. Um, we do a mask, and the mask is heavy uh, symbolized. Um, Glenn Godfrey, the head of the state troopers, uh, who was killed by his ex-lover, uh, was a Kodiak boy from a fog neck. And so we did this closure ceremony for him uh, several years ago. The mask is constructed. Uh, this one talks about his family, uh, talks about the state troopers with the colors. Mm -hmm. He was from a fog neck island. The green represents the island. He was orthodox. There's a trinity in the hoop. Lots of symbolism in, in the mask. Eagle feathers, eagle down, leader great leader in the state. Um, the mask is done. Uh, it's a traditional, and I, I don't like the word potlatch, but that describes it the best for, for people. Uh, we come together, we have a dinner, uh, a feast, if, you know, if you want to use the terminology. Uh, the family provides the food, uh, much like the Athabascan uh, style. Uh, the mask is presented, and this is the widow and Fran Ulmer, and uh, the guests are there. And uh, after uh, the feast, uh, there's speeches. And the speeches, uh, the only rule is you can only speak well. You can say nothing negative during this speech. Uh, because what we're doing is we're instilling the spirit of the community into the object. And uh, that all goes into the object. Uh, and then uh, we dance the mask. And there's a song made, uh, written specially just for the mask. And the dancers prepare. And it's a nighttime activity. Um, everybody gets ready. And then the widow presents the mask. And it's her job. She's letting go. This is a process of letting go. And she gives the mask up, not necessarily willingly, and the dancer does a transformation. The dancer takes the mask, um, puts the mask on, does the transformation. He dances, uh, the song is sung, uh, the fire is there. Um, and there's backup dancers also that, that are with him. And in the end, uh, the spirit is released, and then the mask <coughs> is transformed and we use the fire for the transformation. We did this ceremony for Alphonse Pinart. Um, and and the, the French people had a very, very, very difficult time with it because you were destroying artwork. It, but you did not use one of the ones he had collected. No, 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 we did, we did his mask. Yeah. And th that's interesting. You would not even think of that. Um, if you went to a funeral, would you use a used coffin? You, you never would. You never would. That's what the mask was made for. That's its utility totally from beginning to end. And it's not destruction, it's utility. It was very difficult for the French. And uh, they suggested a dozen ways of non-transforming. <laughs> we'll take care of it, you'll never see it again, don't worry about it. <laughs> they struggle with that. And I was, I was talked to by some very high up folks. We can do all of these things, but this, um, yeah, you're going to burn the mask. And if it's Alphonse's mask, he was French. You can't burn his mask. Oh, and on and on and on. And I would always end up saying, OK, you've been to a funeral. What'd they do with the box? That is what it was made for. That is the utility. Um, and when we did the ceremony in France, they were stunned. We did it in, the, in a castle, mo uh, center of a castle courtyard. Uh, we built the appropriate place. We did the dance. 
we changed the lighting. Uh, you know, typical Western lighting in this courtyard. We changed all the lighting. They, they let us do all of that. And we danced it. And they reacted exactly the way it is at home. They absolutely, when the mask was being transformed, they absolutely came still. And they stood there for 15 minutes while the soul was released. Exactly the same reaction as home. And afterwards, People came to me and said, I understand. Same people that tried to talk, talk I understand. And, and the mayor was very, and it's a very nice human closure. Very nice ceremony. Okay. I want to add one little thing. Thank you. Another thing about another part of transformations related to repatriation in the Smithsonian. I uh -huh. worked at the Smithsonian in the 90s. And believe me, it was kind of like the first museum description when I first went in there. And Did you see it? They were taking Native Americans into their collection. Yeah. They didn't want anyone to touch anything. It was really unbelievable. We had a video conference. Remember the video conference? with art of studies, and it really broke new ground. They didn't want to do that. And I convinced them to have a video conference showing objects in Washington up to here. And, you know, the art of studies program has come a long way, and it's really through repatriation. They learned what, we, what consultation was, and because I would bring people into the collection. So it took, like, six years. Oh, and now long. they're doing oh, it. Now everyone does it, and it's, it's really different. But, you know. Okay. I think uh, three three D copying is going to change some things too. Three uh, D printing, yeah. yeah. With the printer. Yeah. Yep, and we're working with uh, the French on that, and and the big discussion is around once it's done, the process is out there, and anybody theoretically can do it, yeah. and so who owns what, yeah. and then so there's a lot of discussion around that. Yeah, back to possession. I got the real one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very, very, very.